Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this um, first session of uh, the ACT uh, annual conference. We're looking at the economics and politics of Brexit. And I'm absolutely delighted to have a fantastic panel with us uh, today. Uh, we've got Charles Grant, who is the director of the Centre for European Reform. Uh, Sir Ivan Rogers, the UK's former perm permanent representative to the uh, European Union. And Deborah Mattinson, the, the co-founder of Leading Pollsters, uh, Britain Thinks. So it's good morning uh, to all of our panel. All of them are an absolute must read and must uh, listen. Just one or two housekeeping points uh, before we get into uh, our conversation. There is a chat box, uh, so please feel free to pose your questions live into the debate and we'll be able uh, to uh, take them um, during uh, the conversation. The session is being recorded uh, as well, so um, it will be available to uh, download and view again um, almost immediately after uh, our conversation this morning. And then finally, get involved. Uh, take part in the debate on Twitter, uh, and online through uh, LinkedIn and the ACT's uh, social uh, channels um, as well. So despite COVID, Brexit doesn't go away. Um, we're now pretty much in the end game of whether or not we're going to be able to get a deal as we move to the end of the uh, transition period. And, no doubt for many ACT members, this is an incredibly important uh, phase, whether or not we're actually going to see uh, a cliff edge or whether or not we're going to get the kind of uh, deal that I think many businesses, probably most businesses, actually want us to be able to, to achieve. Uh, there's a European summit coming. Uh, there's a self-imposed deadline by the UK government just coming up in the next uh, few days. So we're going to explore with our speakers what are the chances of getting a deal and where we might go um, from here if, in fact, um, a deal is, is not going to be possible. So first up, um, let me hand over to Charles Grant. Um, Charles funded uh, the Centre for European back in 1996, um, former Brussels uh, chief of uh, the Economist, and has really um, been a kind of core author of how uh, the European Union could and, and should reform over uh, the last few years. Charles, your sense of where we are uh, with a Brexit deal? Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> I think uh, the chances of a deal are greater than the chances of no deal. Um, and uh, let me try and explain why. Sorry, there's a, there's a, can people hear me okay? There's an awful echo. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so let me start by saying why the deal is so difficult. Um, a very senior person on the EU side said to me very recently, the trouble with the guys in number 10, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to speak into the microphone like that. The trouble with the guys in number 10 is that they, they don't think about economics. When we talk to them about what kind of deal we can achieve, they say, um, well, we don't really care what economic price we have to pay as long as we can achieve pure untrammeled sovereignty when we're out of the, completely out of the transition phase at the end of the year. And given that the EU is a very economically driven organization, the people in the European Commission think about economics, it's hard for them to cope with and understand and deal with a group of people in number 10 Downing Street who, for whom economics is actually one of the last considerations on their mind as they're 
trying to work out what kind of deal to get. That, that's why it's so difficult. But I still think that a deal is doable. I still think a deal is more likely than not. Um, I, I've always thought that, actually, except when the internal market bill was published a few weeks back. And it looked like, in the, on a very first reading, the British government was trying to scrap the border down the Irish Sea that um, Boris Johnson signed up to last October with Leo Varadkar. Because scrapping that border would mean there'd have to be a border on the, between the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland, which would be awful for the Irish and most, most many other people as well. And, but when I realised that the internal market bill wasn't actually trying to scrap the board, it was rather an appeal for attention. It was a child throwing his toys out of the pram and that the, uh, the problems that the British government has raised about, about the withdrawal agreement are fixable. Then I thought, actually, I went back to thinking a deal is more likely than not. All the problems that the British government has with the withdrawal agreement can be fixed through the joint committee which uh, both sides have set up, uh, run by Michael Gove on the British side and Sefcovic on the EU side. Uh, in particular, there are worries about the state aid rules applying to Northern Ireland reaching back into, the, into Great Britain. The, the EU just needs to give some reassurances and that it doesn't intend to control British state aid, Great British state aid through via Northern Ireland. The export declarations that on goods going from Northern Ireland into, the, into Great Britain can be dealt with uh, I think, but I think, that, I think that, need, that needn't be a problem. It's not fundamental to the functioning of the single market. And the EU lets both Switzerland and Norway off, off having to do such export declarations. Why can't it let off Northern Ireland as well? Um, the, uh, the goods going from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, with the British government's worried about tariffs applying to those goods and which goods the tariffs will apply to. Well, uh, if there is a t if there is a free trade agreement, those tariffs are greatly reduced anyway. They're not less of a problem and. Uh, why should, can't the joint committee simply agree now on which goods are like are at risk of going from Northern Ireland in, on into the EU and therefore need to be subject to controls when they cross the Irish Sea? As for the, for the food blockade that Boris Johnson appeared to get worried about of goods, uh, the, the apparent threat that the EU would not allow food from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, all, all that has to happen, and it is in fact happening, is that the EU has to recognise British SPS rules as equivalent to its own and therefore it will allow who imports the food. I think all those problems are fixable. But of course, it was an unfortunate episode because it did really annoy the EU hugely. It, it led to people to, to reduce their trust they felt for the British government. And it will mean that the EU is going to be much tougher now on the rules on governance of the agreement than it would have been anyway. It's going to be quite tough on governance, but dispute settlement and so on. The EU is going to be absolutely eagle eyed to make sure it doesn't allow the British any way to wriggle out of what it signs up to in the dispute settlement rules agreed in the free trade agreement. So on the free trade agreement itself, I, Ivan will speak about this in more detail than I, I will do, but um, I think uh, there has been progress in the talks in recent weeks. Both sides have reduced the extreme positions they started out with. I think on the so-called level playing field issues, the, the obvious compromise is that Britain will agree not to go backwards in the rules it does apply today. And the EU has the right to punish the British by withdrawing market access if the British do go backwards. It's easier said than done, of course, to put all that into detailed t text and a treaty. But I think, I think the level playing field is fixable. Most of the other issues are fixable. The most difficult issue, of course, is state aid. And there, everybody's rather baffled by the Dominic Cummings view, which is that Britain mustn't submit any, any state aid, mustn't submit for the EU's approval any state aid regime at all. Apparently, Cummings wants to subsidise lots of high-tech industries in the future, a volante, as much as he wishes when he wants and the way he wants. And he will have to be overruled on that issue if there's going to be an agreement, because the EU will not agree to let the British off any state aid system at all. The British will have to sign up to some sort of comparable system to the EU's own system, not exactly the same. And the EU may have to live with being notified after the event rather than before the event. But I think wise men on both sides and wise women could, if they wished, come up with a compromise on state aid. But that is, that, that is the most difficult issue. The real reason why I think a deal will happen is I think the political pressures on Boris Johnson to achieve a deal are going to only, can only grow in the coming months. I believe, and I don't claim to know what's going on in his head, but I believe he does want a deal. Cummings, many people believe, does not want a deal. Uh, Michael Gove, I'm fairly certain, really wants a deal because he's in charge of the no-deal preparations and understands why a deal matters. The people in the middle who matter are Boris Johnson and, and David Frost. I think they both want a deal, but of course, without having to compromise too much. The reason why Boris's desire for a deal will grow is mainly COVID-19. I've heard this from people in number 10, that the, the worse COVID gets, the harder it's going to be for the, for the government to inflict a no-deal Brexit on the UK, which would lead to more chaos than a, than a FTA Brexit. 
uh, uh, there would, I mean, there's going to be chaos at the borders anyway, whatever happens, but the chaos will be worse if there's no deal because there'll be more things to check on goods going into the EU and there'll be less goodwill on both sides to ameliorate the, the difficulties at the border. So uh, a, a chaotic Brexit with no deal would just add to the government's reputation for incompetence rather than competence. And the government knows that and it's worried about its reputation after the, the way it's handled COVID and the way it's handled schools exams. So I think the worse COVID gets, the more the pressure on Boris Johnson to get a deal. Then there's a the Scottish factor. Um, certainly Michael Gove is aware and others in number 10 are aware that, uh, that the worse the chaos of Brexit and the worse the no deal Brexit, then the better for the Scottish National Party in the elections due next May. And that is a factor Consider that some people in Downing Street are, are worried about. And then there's the business voices. Now, we've heard very little about business. But most businesses have kept their voices closed in recent months on Brexit because they think they'll get punished if they speak out too much in favour for a deal. And they, they don't think they'll have much good, make much impact anyway. And it's probably, that's probably true. That it's, it is probably true the guys in number 10 don't really care what a lot of businesses think. But the other Tories do, backbenchers do, cabinet ministers do. And I think if we look like we're heading for no deal, businesses will start to squeal very loudly. And so will backbenchers. And we've learned that backbenchers have power in the last few weeks. The government's majority is not as large as it looks in practice. The backbenchers can push the government in certain directions. And so can cabinet ministers who have not been consulted on Brexit strategy at all so far. So that's, that's, the, that's the source of my optimism. Essentially, I think the British government needs a deal. And on the EU side, the EU needs a deal too. It wants a deal quite badly. It stayed united in its fairly tough line, but it is beginning to compromise on issues like fish and, and state aid. It's moved off from its initial position. I think the Germans, of course, the, the, the Tory Eurosceptic idea that the Germans will ride to the rescue and intervene to get a deal so they can export BMWs to us is, is rubbish, of course. The Germans will stick with the 27, but the Germans certainly want a deal. And Angela Merkel understands very clearly the geostrategic costs of no deal and how that will strengthen Europe's enemies. Because if there's no deal, security cooperation will undoubtedly be hit. And she cares about that. My one slight caveat for my generally optimistic line, and I'm coming to the end now, is Emmanuel Macron. The French have been the toughest of the tough on state aid, on, on fish, on many other issues. And, I, and while the other 26 certainly want to deal and would be prepared to compromise quite a long way to get a deal, I'm not entirely sure the French will compromise a long way to get a deal. Because any deal on fish is bad for Macron. If there is a deal on fish, it is bad for Macron because French fishermen will have fewer fish than they have today. And that's quite, quite bad for him. So I think you, you could construct a scenario, and I have heard this from people in the British government, whereby Macron would prefer there to be a no deal, chaotic Brexit, French fishermen lose all their fishing rights for a few months, then, then there's a renegotiation and eventually there is a deal and Macron saves half the French fishermen's fish. I hope that's not the case, but I'm not entirely certain where Macron is, is going to go. He is capable of standing out on his own, as he did a year and a half ago on the extension of the Brexit. Uh, uh, the, 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 the extension that, that Theresa May asked for of, of the Brexit deadline and he stood out and stopped the EU giving the British a long extension. And my last word is this does actually matter because as, as Ian said at the start, although the macroeconomic difference between deal and no deal is not enormous, it's a 5% hit to your GDP or an 8% hit to your GDP, the politics is hugely different. If, if we do leave with a deal, however thin and meagre that deal is, it can be built on and improved on in future years with future governments. And if we leave with no deal, the acrimony will prevent security cooperation and prevent building a future better partnership for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, so, I'll, so to conclude, I think there will be a deal, but I have some worries and some caveats. Thank you very much. Charles, th thank you. And thank you for uh, bearing with uh, the system there. I hope you're hearing us. Uh, well, I think the, the recommendation to the speakers is probably when you're speaking to turn your own sound down so that you're not getting too much uh, feedback. Let me hand over now to um, Sir Ivan. Um, Ivan, I think it's fair to say you're a little bit more pessimistic than Charles that we're going to get a deal. Well, thanks, Ian. Um, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I, um, and I don't think that's new. Um, I've been fairly pessimistic since the day I quit, indeed, before the day I quit, which is now nearly four years ago. Um, essentially because I could never see how Theresa May could get what became her version of Brexit uh, through her own party and through the House of Commons. Um, and I thought that in late 2016, uh, that she boxed herself in uh, to a version of Brexit that was unsaleable to the bulk of her own party unless she reached out across uh, the Commons to moderate Labour and Liberal Democrats, she had no chance of getting it through, and I fear that was right. 
And I fear now that Boris Johnson is also more boxed in um, uh, and was always going to be more boxed in. I fear I, I was saying that nearly a year ago publicly in lectures that I thought he was setting up these negotiations in a sequencing that was bound to land him in the situation he's now in. Now, I don't at all rule out that Charles could be right and that in the end, uh, Johnson in extremis thinks it's better to do a shabby, uh, very skinny free trade deal, which is not a good deal for the country. Incidentally, it's very poor and services very thin indeed on services. It's pretty poor on industrial goods and markedly worse for industrial goods sectors than Theresa May's was. But he may feel that he can still sell that as a negotiating triumph and the free trade deal of our dreams. I don't rule that out. I don't think a final decision has yet been taken by the by the main people and and Charles has listed the main people. The reason I, I let me set out, though, uh, because my analysis is very similar, I think, to Charles is what the uh, about both the issues and the solubility of those issues. Why am I a bit more pessimistic? Because, as Charles said, I think it's the politics that drives this, not the economics. Um, on the economics, he rightly says the vast bulk of the hit from leaving the European Union. I know that many in the government wouldn't accept that there is a hit, um, even privately, but nearly all sane, serious economists on all sides of the divide would say that the bulk of the hit in the next five to 10 years from leaving the European Union comes from leaving the single market and the customs union. And that we do in any case, even in the event of a deal in three months time, uh, that has that hit. Some elements of that hit have already uh, hit the UK economy, but the vast bulk of the hit is still to come. And, and it's not just Treasury figures, it's Office of Budget Responsibility figures and it's independent economists saying that the vast bulk of the economic damage, two thirds to three quarters of the damage of a no deal would be constituted by leaving the single market and customs union. We're going to do that anyway. The reason I'm a bit more pessimistic is knowing Boris Johnson, I work for him as foreign secretary, um, this, this stuff about divergence and the capability to diverge and to move away very deliberately from the European economic and social model is central to his version of Brexit. It was not central to Theresa May's version. This is the buccaneering, bold, mid-Atlantic, more deregulatory, although there are masses of contradictions, obviously, in Johnsonian economic policy insofar as we know what it is. But this obsession with what is called in the in the trade, I suppose, the Brussels effect, namely the ability of the regulatory hegemon that we live next to, to sort of dictate terms and to export its standards and its norms and its rule book uh, to third countries. And we are now a third country and to sort of impose its will uh via um the sheer weight of the kind of regulatory order that always mattered immensely to johnson it was very difficult to get a huge amount of sense out of him as to what mattered and why it mattered and where we wished to diverge and how that was going to work but it always was central to his version of brexit and i think the state aids issue that um that uh charles has touched on is absolutely central to that I agree with Charles that on these so-called level playing field issues, I mean, I've always hated this jargon when working within the European Union, but the level playing field stuff, most of this is soluble by what would in trade deal terms be standard, bog standard non-regression clauses. In other words, and you do this in trade deals across the globe, you agree not to go backwards on current levels of, of regulation. Whether you can trust the British side entirely to do that on environment and social, you know, goodness knows, but I think the EU will take that risk. They won't take a risk on state aids. And let me be clear, they over egged it and overbid in their original negotiating mandate and basically demanded that the UK align with the existing EU state aids rule book in perpetuity after leaving. Uh, that was French driven, but it wasn't only French driven, it was also Eastern European uh, driven. It was also an unreasonable demand. No sovereign state is going to say that it will agree dynamically to up update its rule book on state aids and subsidies, on taxation, on spending, on, on the kind of preferences you give to companies to advance your industrial policy. No sovereign country is going to agree to update dynamically in line with a rule book it has no part of setting. In fairness to Michel Barnier, he's known right since the outset that that was an unreasonable proposition and he wouldn't be able to get it uh, through. The difficulty is the UK has had an equally unreasonable proposition of essentially saying this is nothing whatever to do with you, it's nothing to do with the trade deal, what we choose to do by way of our autonomous and sovereign industrial policy and which subsidies we give and on what terms and how we do that is nothing to do with you. 
Now, the question is the degree to which, and that's also a disreputable position economically. Um, I had an Eastern European um, old colleague say to me within the last few weeks, so essentially the UK government is saying to us that they want to be able to build, you know, uh, IT and AI and biotech and fintech champions. They want to be able to um, put quite considerable subsidies into those firms in order to be able to grow them to become both national champions and regional champions and potentially global players. They want those players to be able to compete on our market with our own firms who are unable to benefit from anything like the same level of subsidy. Um, and we're living under a different subsidy regime, different state aids regime and under different fiscal rules. And you think that'll be fine for us. And so think of it, I, I've had that objection from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, from Nordic Europe, from Ireland, uh, as well as from France and Germany. It totally unifies the 27. So if originally Boris Johnson, advised by David Frost, said and thought that he could get a duty-free tariff, a tariff-free, quota-free, skinny free trade deal without level playing field conditionality above all in state aids, they're dreaming. Um, now. They know that now, they must know that because Frost has heard it repeatedly from Barnier over the last several negotiating sessions. The question is, what's the solution here? Because as Charles says, this is easily the thorniest and biggest issue. The only solution that the others will bear, and Charles is right to mention the, um, the further damage to levels of trust over the internal market bill. Um, this is being slightly misinterpreted in terms of what, how, it's be, how the EU is reacting. It's reacting quite sensibly by splitting its legal reaction from its political reaction. And it's determined not to walk out of the negotiations under any circumstances and to negotiate to the bitter end. If there's going to be a walkout, it's going to be a British walkout is the, is the EU's position. But what unnerves people is that if, if nine months after having declared a withdrawal agreement is a massive negotiating triumph, he can say in the summer of 2020, oh, it turned out to be a mortal threat to the sovereignty of the United Kingdom and a dagger aimed at us. And therefore, I need to introduce an internal market bill that enables me to repudiate uh, significant central elements of the withdrawal agreement. If he's able to do that on the withdrawal agreement, having declared it a triumph and pushed it through the House of Commons solely on conservative votes, why would he not do that again on the free trade agreement next year if they agreed a free trade agreement? So as Charles said, they were always going to be tough on governance and dispute resolution, but they're going to be even tougher now because you need to nail this guy to the floor, as somebody put it to me. Um, somebody very well placed put it to me. And the trouble is, of course, if they want to nail him to the floor, that makes it much more difficult for him to sign up. Because what does that mean? That means they need binding dispute resolution so that if they agree a set of principles with the British about what should underpin the subsidies regimes on both sides of the channel, they need to know um, that those principles will be abided by and breaches of those principles could be contested in an arbitration process, which leads to a dispute resolution, which would be binding on the loser of that dispute resolution. And in my view, Charles may be more optimistic, but from everything I've heard from colleagues over the last, or ex-colleagues over the last few weeks, they're not going to back off that because that's absolutely essential demand for them. And it's not just France, it's not just Germany. As I say, it's Eastern and Central Europe and it's Southern Europe. And I think that's genuinely difficult. I mean, quite clear that Cummings would oppose that. We can have our own views about exactly the nature and purpose of the Cummings uh, view on that. He may want less technocratic control at the domestic level and an, independence, uh, an independent regulator of competition policy operating on clear principles. Who knows what the grounds are for this? But as Charles correctly said, if Johnson is to achieve a deal in the next few weeks, he's going to have to overrule his chief of staff on that key point. Uh, now, he may have support from Michael Gove or Rishi Sunak or whatever in doing so. But... Where I end is with the politics of this within his own party and the politics um, in the base of the Conservative Party, but also the politics in the red wall seats, which I think Deborah will uh, will come on and address. And there it seems to me to be problematic. There, I think David Gork, amongst others, who's become a, a sort of vocal uh, an intelligent critic of the government from outside, having been expelled from his own party. And to be clear, David Gork started as a very, you know, solidly Eurosceptic uh, conservative. This is not a, a, a dripping Europhile saying this, but he's seen no evidence. And I must say, I've seen no evidence that Johnson is at the moment preparing the ground to disappoint the European research group and the people on the right of his party and do a deal 
which they would essentially oppose. Now, Charles would rightly say to that, I think, well, they may oppose it, but where can they go? And he would have a majority in the House. He's not in Theresa May's position. He could push it through. He could also quietly be saying to them, trust me, you know, if it comes to it and they do something we just disagree with on the state aids and subsidies or any other element of the FTA, you know, I'll find a way to override it via domestic legislation. He may give all manner of assurances to say that he remains a true hardline Brexiteer. But bear in mind that the true hardline Brexiteers do not want him to do a deal in the next few weeks. They want to go no deal. And they think either because they think no deal is perfectly surmountable and perfectly tolerable as a long term destination. I personally think that's wrong for all of you uh, listening into this call. Or they think it's only at that point that the European Union would behave more reasonably because they, they had seen that we were prepared to go through with this and then they would ultimately come back to the table and do a different shape of FTA, which was much closer to the sort of genuine Canadian deal of their dreams. All of this stuff, in my view, is Fantasy Island, and I've been saying it's Fantasy Island for a very long time, but it's still there. And in the Conservative Party at the moment, the bulk of the people who are most critical of him on COVID-19 politics, and I think this is where I disagree a bit with Charles on the, the way in which the politics is running in number 10, the people who are most vehemently critical of him on his conduct and COVID-19 are also the hardline Brexiteers. There's an extraordinary overlap between the two, so two groups. And he's polling very badly inside the Conservative Party at the moment, polling at cabinet level only above Gavin Williamson um, in Conservative Party polling. So I agree with Charles, he's got a problem. He does have a problem on competence. It's possible because of COVID-19 and the worsening of COVID-19, he goes in the direction uh, Charles says. But I'll conclude by saying I wouldn't count on it. And I think the politics may play the other way in the next few weeks. And I don't think the EU is going to give much ground. They'll try and, and don't think they'll give, you know, give a little bit on fish, but they won't give anything on state aids. And whilst they'll help him by trying to package it in a way they think he can sell it, they aren't going to give anything fundamental, which enables him to get through the next few weeks. Ivan, um, thank you. Um, a, a, a very interesting counterpoint to our opener from Charles there. So we're going to get a deal, we may, may not get a deal. As Ivan says, politics is, of course, right at the heart of this, much more than economics uh, right now. Let's talk about the politics. Deborah, you've just published a book on uh, the Red Wall. For those who are dialing in internationally, uh, those are the seats that Boris Johnson picked up um, in, in December, uh, in the December UK general election, those former Labour seats. Um, what do you think is governing the political thinking um, around deal or no deal right now? So, yeah, thanks. And, and thanks to um, Ivan and Charles for really interesting briefings as well. Um, I'm going to talk about three things, actually, Ian, if that's OK. I was going to just go back in time a little bit and remind people of, uh, of how public opinion has tracked out since 2016, when we had the referendum. Um, I'm then going to bring it up to date and look overall at where we are now. And then the last few moments, I just do want to focus on the red wall because I think in the end, as, um, as Ivan ha has just suggested, I think that how the red wall feels is going to be quite instrumental in determining the political choices that are taken. So starting with um, 2016 and where we all were. So after the referendum, the company that I lead, Britain Thinks, um, did a piece of work that we called the Brexit Diaries. And we've been tracking public opinion from then right up until earlier this year, immediately pre-COVID. And we're in fact about to go back in the field and do a final wave. Well, what may be a final wave or may not, depending on how things unfold. Um, but the first piece of work that we did was a segmentation piece where we took the population and we divided it into attitudinal groups. And we came up with four groups and the people listening here from the UK can decide themselves which group they fit into. So the first was a group of the diehards. These were people who were absolutely delighted by the referendum result. Then we had a group we called the cautious optimists who were pleased with the result, but had a few reservations. Then we had a group called the accepting pragmatists who, although they had themselves voted remain, they were now reluctantly accepting that we probably were going to leave. And then finally, we had a group, and when we presented this in the early days, we illustrated it with a little icon of a man sitting with his head on his desk in despair. And we called them the devastated pessimists. They were people who had voted remain, 
been quite enthusiastic about Remain and could see no good outcome at all. And we measured the size of each of these groups. They were basically a third of the population were diehards, a third of the population were devastated pessimists, and the two, if you like, milder middle groups were about the remaining third each uh, between them. And the really interesting thing tracking this all the way through from 2016 is that those groups, the size of those groups, barely shifted. So it's been pretty constant all the way through and quite divided. So where are we now? Well, the first thing to say is that Brexit has enjoyed a, a sort of top ranking in terms of the issues that people were concerned about for all of this period, pretty much. However, once COVID struck, it dropped right down. It slipped down the issues of concern and health and econ the economy have surged up to the top. In fact, 52% of us say they are paying little or even no attention at all to any of the Brexit comings and goings. What do they think is likely to happen? Well, only 24% think that no deal is a good outcome. 50% uh, think it's bad and 25% don't know. Only 22% think a deal is likely. Only 2% think it's very likely. And 60% think that the government is doing me on all of this. But when asked which party would be the best party to manage Brexit, the Conservatives are still ahead at 33%. Uh, Don't Know is in second place at 25%. Labour on 14 and the Lib Dems on 9. And there was some excitement actually a few days ago uh, at the New European magazine, which is very, you know, obviously very pro-Europe, about a poll that said 61% would now support Remain uh, in hindsight. In hindsight, that was where they felt they should have voted. But immediately, full fact, pulled them up doing an analysis of that and pointing out that the question presumed that the only choice was Remain or the current deal. So in a way, that wasn't a very accurate take on what was happening. So I think that people are still quite gloomy. What do the Red Wall think? Now, just a reminder on the Red Wall, as Ian has said, they are that group of seats from the Midlands in the UK that stretch up to the north, across to the northwest and into Wales, and then up and into the northeast. Two thirds of people in the Red Wall voted leave. So quite strongly leave. It's a group of people who are pretty disillusioned with politics, feel very neglected, um, but saw the Brexit vote as different. Uh, they felt that it was a new start, opening up huge opportunities for their much neglected local communities. So Ken, a retired butcher that I chatted to when I was doing research for the book, said, here in the UK, we used to have the best of engineering, of agriculture, fishing. Now we can set our own rules again. We will. It's a huge enthusiasm. One man told me how on, w on waking up to learn that we'd gone Brexit, he'd leapt out of bed and he'd run round his bedroom, punching the air. He felt that England, as if England had won the World Cup. He went on to add, it was also a chance to stick two fingers up to the elite, which I think just gives you a clue to the kind of mindset that people had around that, particularly these red wall voters. So, it may that people had for switching from Labour and their lifelong Labour voters to Boris Johnson's Conservatives. So, I interviewed a lot of people for my book earlier in the year. And I went back to re-interview some of them as recently as this week, uh, to see if Red Wall has still felt that it was a priority. They did, they do. So Ian, a plumber from Accrington was really clear. He said, if Brexit was dropped now, I'd be disappointed. It would feel like the elites, and that's the term we hear again and again, the elites had wriggled out of it again. And I pressed him, I said, look, even if there was no deal, how would you feel? He'd wanted a deal. He was an enthusiastic lever, but he wanted a deal. He said, even if there was, even if there was no deal. We just need to get on with it. We need to make our way on our own in the world. But expectations for what happens after that are very high in the Red Wall, and there's a lot to play for, for all sides politically. And perhaps if I leave it there, Ian, see if there are any questions. Uh, lots of questions um, kind of coming through, Deborah. Thank you very, very um, much indeed. Let's, given the time we've got available, um, let's go, we've got about 10 minutes, so let, let's actually go straight into um, our um, audience questions. Uh, and, and the first one we've got up front, um, uh, given the risk of no deal, what are the top two to three risks which you'd advise corporates to prepare for? Um, maybe, Ivan, can I go to you with, with that one? What, what should companies be thinking about uh, right now um, if 
you know, your more likely scenario, I no deal pans out. Well, obviously, crucially, it depends on sectors. No deal is much worse for those industrial goods sectors who would find a skinny deal. I mean, as I say, worse than Theresa May's deal, but nevertheless, a lot better than nothing. So, you know, aviation, aerospace, autos, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, food and drink industry do get appreciable gains out of a skinny deal. And for no deal, uh, as, as Charles says, the real implications are both geostrategic, but they're also economic. If, if it collapses now, it will be acrimonious. I mean, Boris Johnson will say it's only collapsed because the European Union was determined to humiliate us, colonize us, turn us into a client state. If he does that, and he would have to do that in order to sell it to the Red Wall and everyone else, uh, the EU will react in kind. So this idea that we'll all be sitting down amicably at some point in early 2021 saying, well, it was a shame it all went wrong. What are we going to do now? That won't happen. So I think my main advice on no deal, if you do end up with no deal, is prepare it, prepare for it to be a very long standing state, years, not months, in my view. Charles, can I maybe to get, go to you with, an, with another one here, which is um, to what extent will a, a FTA deal provide some coverage of services? Or will it in practice merely um, cover the trade in physical goods? As we've been you know, sharing in this conversation, um, I mean, uh, also under Theresa May, not a lot about services in any of these conversations. Um, what, what do you see um, either with a skinny deal or indeed a long-term conversation about a longer-term FDA? Um, how do you see services being covered in any of this? There'll be very little on services in the kind of FTA we're going to get, Ian. Um, I mean, the, the, basically, an FTA is quite is better, quite as Ivan says, is a lot better than no deal at all for the manufacturing sector because of the tariff issue. But tariffs don't benefit services anyway. Uh, the, 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 what, what matters for services is being outside the single market, which is a regulatory union, and our service companies in, in areas like media, financial services, business services will take a hit because they will no longer have the right to operate freely and easily in the EU market without sort of registering and becoming local in the various markets concerned. There will be a basic minimum about the right of establishment uh, as, as you know, uh, the, uh, the sort that Canada and the EU have given each other. But even, even things like the re mutual recognition of professional qualifications will be much less good than what we have today. It will be harder for British professionals to go and work in the EU. We have almost very little on services indeed, but that I'm afraid is, 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 is one of the consequences of going for a, for a minimal skinny Canada style free trade agreement, not much on services at all. Thanks, Charles. Um, all right, let's go to directly a very political question. This is a good one for you, uh, Deborah, actually thinking about US politics. So, you know, we're trying to do this deal as um, uh, the, uh, the country perhaps that Boris Johnson wants to tilt towards most. Um, the US is in the middle of a rather excitable uh, general election itself. Question here, would a Biden or Trump, what would a, tr a Biden or Trump approach to the UK be in 2021? What's your kind of decoding of that as you look at uh, US politics and again, what it might mean for the next two or three months um, in terms of a deal? Well, of course, the US politics, they have their own version of the Red Wall, which is the Rust Belt states which is basically you know the group group of seats very similar um that will probably determine the outcome in a few weeks time uh which is looking i would say very close um i mean the democrats have been quite clear haven't they they've been very unhappy about about you know what they see as as britain breaking international law and have been quite clear that uh, you know they don't they don't take that sympathetically uh so a biden outcome potentially is quite a, you know a bad outcome uh, from Boris Johnson's point of view, clearly, uh, you know, Trump certainly has set himself up as a friend of Britain, but how friendly he would actually be when he's wanting to put America first and make America great again remains to be seen, I think. Uh, and it brings a whole host of problems with your, you know, chlorinated chicken and the like as well. So, I, I, you know, I think probably neither is a particularly good outcome, frankly. Yeah, I, Ivan, can I maybe bring you on on this too, uh, having having kind of sat in government. Do you think the US poll has any impact on where we're going to land? 
I think it could do. And there are, I, I've had many Europeans say to me that they assumed that Boris Johnson would wait anyway before taking a final decision until November the 3rd, which is interesting that they think it. And they think that he wants a Trump victory and the vast bulk of them want a Biden victory. And they think that a Biden victory will bring, I mean, they're not deluding themselves that Biden will be the greatest friend of the European Union and suddenly warm up relations massively. But they do think that Biden will reach out more to Berlin and Paris and somewhat relegate uh, London in the world order. And that Biden and the people around Biden remember Johnson's personal role in, in, in Trump's victory in 2016. I think all of that is true. I don't think Biden is anti-UK. Incidentally, I think he's very pro-Irish and he has an Irish antecedents. And I think what was interesting about Dominic Raab's visit to Washington was they really had miscalculated the kind of congressional politics, the politics on the Hill on both sides. And they were clearly taken by surprise by the strength of reaction they got, not just from Nancy Pelosi, but from Biden himself. And they've had it incidentally from Republican sources. My, my own view is you know, a UK, UK US deal is a very high priority for Boris Johnson, not just for Liz Truss and Dominic Cummings and David Frost. It's a it's a geostrategic pivot that they want. Uh, it'll be very difficult to get it and to do it and to get it through Congress without real concessions on food hygiene standards and food production standards that will go down quite badly, I suspect, with the bulk of the, the English and British middle class. So I think it's quite difficult to do it, but I, I know that it matters enormously to Johnson and is, that he's a great enthusiast about getting a US free trade deal. And I think it would be a, a very high priority for him to try and conclude that with the Trump administration in 2021. And Charles, do you, do you want to make just a quick comment on this overlay of the US poll, uh, firstly, and then uh, we've literally got about two, three minutes left, but your, your thought as well on if we are going to get a limited deal, just to sort of, you know, give us some headlines on what that limited deal may contain. Well, on the on the US side, um, I think. Uh, uh, sorry, I lost my thread. Sorry, on the on, on, on the U, U, the US side, I think I, th I don't think there'll be an FTA with the US. I don't think it's going to happen because the British are not going to sign up to what the US wants on food safety. The fact that we are going to accept EU rules on food safety so that we can export our agricultural produce into the EU after the transition period ends means that it's much less interesting for the US because the US is, con is concerned mainly in increasing Britain as a market for its agricultural goods, which would be much harder with the Britain following EU rules on food safety. So I think that makes it very hard indeed to get any kind of FTA. And opening, up, opening up the health service to competition from US suppliers as well is difficult. So I think whatever Liz Truss and Boris may want, I think it's extremely unlikely it will be anything approaching a normal FTA between Britain and the U US in the near future. Um, what was your other question, Ian? Um, Oh, really, 30 seconds on um, if we are going to get a deal um, uh, with, with the European Union, what do you think, what's going to be the headline? The headline will be manufacturers excuse tariffs, but still masses of bureaucracy and delays at the border because of all the complicated form filling that will go on at borders. Very little for service industries, very little for freedom of movement and professional qualifications. Businesses deprived of the right to hire people when they want in the way they want. I think it, uh, and, and but, but, but at least it's something you can build to help them. The main point to get across here is if you get a very thin, rather not very good deal, you can build on it and get better. A Labour government would change the deal and probably rejoin a customs union, for example. I think that's quite likely. Well, if there's no deal, then it's acrimonious yeah. and, and the desire, financial markets react very badly indeed. Deborah, 15 seconds. What's the headline we're going to be waking up to um, on whether or not we've got a deal or not? Uh, I think we'll get a deal. That's so it kind of <laughs> yes, we, we, we got a deal is, is and, and Ivan, um, the pantomime of all of this, um, your, your thought on the headline that we'll wake up to um, in October or November or whenever it comes. Well, I agree. I agree with Charles on the content of it. A skinny deal. I'm not a fan of a skinny deal. I would rather have it for the reasons he would rather have it. Bear in mind, Johnson would have to sell it as a massive negotiating triumph and that he got the free trade deal of his dreams. And the question, therefore, he will be asking himself is, can he do that reputably and get away with it both in the party and in the country? That's all that he will oversell it massively. And the EU side knows that. And he will say that he only got the deal because he put yep. the internal markets bill on the table. And that's what brought the Europeans to heel. That's how he'll present Great. it if there's a deal. Uh, thanks to you all. Thank you to all for joining us. Hopefully the picture's a bit clearer for all of you.
um, and enjoy the rest of the conference.